In the news today, the Chief of Staff to the President, Malam Abba Kiari, is dead. He died on Friday at the age of 81. The Senior Special Assistant to the President of Media and Publicity, Malam Garba who said the deceased died of COVID-19. Announcing Mr. Kiari's death via his verified Twitter handle, Garba Shehu wrote, and I quote, The presidency regrets to announce the passage of the chief of staff to the president, Malam Abba Kiari. The deceased had tested positive to the ravaging COVID-19 and had been receiving treatment, but he died on Friday, April 17, 2020, end of quote. Shehu said funeral arrangements for the deceased would be announced soon. The special advisor to the president of media and publicity, Femi Adishina, also wrote via his verified Twitter handle, and I quote again, Chief of Staff to the President, Malam Abba Kiari, passes on. May God rest his soul. Amen. Funeral arrangements to be announced soon. End of quote. Kiari had tested positive for the coronavirus in March after a trip to Germany and Egypt. Doctors attending to the late Chief of Staff had obtained his medical records from Wellington Hospital, St. John's Woods, London, which showed that Mr. Kiari had some other ailments that could hamper his rate of recovery from COVID-19. The Wellington Hospital, which is located in North London, is the largest independent hospital in the United Kingdom. Kiari, in a letter on March the 29th, had said he was conveyed to Lagos on an air ambulance to do additional tests and observation, adding that he took the decision based on medical advice as a precautionary measure. He further stated that he had made his personal personal care arrangements to avoid further burden in the public health system, which is currently facing so much pressure. However, the Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Haniri, refused to disclose where Kayari was receiving treatment. The Commissioner for Health in Lagos State, Professor Akin Abayomi, later said he did not know Kayari's location, thereby sparking reports that the President's aid was not in any isolation center in Lagos. Responding to a question during a recent presidential task force briefing in Abuja, the health minister said Kiari's location was not important, adding that the president's chief of staff had a right to privacy. Reacting to the news, the national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Prince Uche Sekundas, describing the death as shocking. He said he had prayed for the recovery of the late chief of staff, adding that he was shocked to hear about his, his death. He said, and I quote, this is shocking. I am sad to hear this bad news. Why now? I wish to console with the president, the members of his cabinet, the family members of Kari, and all his associates. The death is a reminder to all of us that whatever we are today, it is by the grace of God. He is the one that owns us and the one that can call us home at any time. Once more, I pray for the repose of the soul of the distinguished Nigerian. End of quote. We now move to Abuja, where our correspondent, Amadine Uyi, gives us a short report on the life and times of Abba Kiari. Undoubtedly the most powerful of all presidential aides, the late Abba Kiari was a man to reckon with. Shrewd, calculative, serious-minded, but with an amiable smile. Many who had come across the most powerful chief of staff to the president since the advent of the Fourth Republic, we admit he was not one to be taken for granted. The late Abba Kiari was appointed by President Mohamed Buhari on August 27, 2015, a few months after the 2015 general elections. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from the University of Warwick, England. He is also said to possess a Bachelor of Arts degree in Law from the University of Cambridge, England, and was called to the Nigerian bar after attending the Nigerian Law School in 1983. In 1984, he obtained a master's degree in law from the University of Cambridge. He later attended the International Institute for Management Development at Louis in Switzerland, and participated in the Program for Management Development at the Harvard Business School in 1992 and 1994. The late Abakiari worked with the new Nigeria Development Company, New Africa Holdings, Africa International Bank, United Bank for Africa, Unilever, and Mobile in various capacities over the years. From Borno State, 
The former banker and ex-journalist has never left anyone in doubt over his huge influence on the presidency. As the chief of staff to the president, Mr. Kiari determined who would have an audience with President Muhammad Ubari. The memos the president would see, the mails he would read, and those not needed around the president, no matter how highly placed they were. Over the years, he is known to have had rifts with several highly placed political figures, many of them soon to be kicked out of office. Notably among these include the former Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Ibe Kachiko, the former Head of Service of the Federation, Winifred Oyoita, the former Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Inland Revenue Service, Babatuni Faula, and the current National Security Advisor, Babagana Mungunu, the only one that survived Mr. Kiari's acts. Always at the side of the President, many viewed Abba Kiari as Nigeria's de facto Prime Minister. Always seen with his trademark file in hand within the presidential villa, Kiari is regarded as an astute administrator with an eye for details pushing President Mohamed Bari's reform agenda behind the scenes. One who has never appeared bothered about criticism, Mr. Kiari did a successful job in staying focused on the tax assigned to him by Mr. President. His influence was further confirmed when on August 21, 2019, President Mohamed Bari made it resoundingly clear to ministers and appointees of government to go through Abba Kiari in case of any attempt to see him. On March 30, 2020, via his statement, the late Abba Kiari confirmed to Nigerians he had contacted the coronavirus. Mr. Kiari says he was being moved to Lagos for further tests and observation and that he had followed protocols. On April the 18th, about 12.37 a.m., Via a letter from the Senior Special Assistant to President Muhammad Dubari on media and publicity, Femi Adeshina, the announcement came that Mr. Kiari had passed away on April the 17th. It is clear Mr. Kiari will be sorely missed by President Muhammad Dubari and those operating within the corridors of power. Amadin Uyi, Plus TV Africa. And joining us live in the studio is legal practitioner and social commentator, Liberos Oshomo. Good morning. Oshoma, rather. Good morning. Good morning. And good to have you this morning. How do you react to this news that we are beginning with? Yeah, um, it's a big blow. It's a sad one. Um, um, when um, the news first broke that he had, um, you know, contacted the uh, coronavirus, a lot of us, you know, were skeptical that will be able to make it considering his age and then you know um, at that age is really not about um, it's more about your immunity mm -hmm. and then um, you know there are some illness that comes with age you, you know and and so and that's why you find that that you know when this first started a lot of people you know want to protect the aged and all of that and mm -hmm. so when the news broke also I felt very bad um, so though some people um, there have been mixed feelings, right. about, you know, from some quarters, certain quarters, especially considering the fact that a lot of people see him as a de facto president, Correct. and um, he's, he's what you would call the um, aneni of, um, of of this government. Uh, you know what aneni was to Obasanjo, that's what basically he is to Buhari. And like your reporter said. It's one not to, you know, bother himself with criticism. Mm -hmm. It's somebody who is, you, you know, hate him or like him is very focused. You hardly hear from him, you know, but he does what he wants to do and he really does not care. And so because he's um, one to be, you know, seen and not heard, hardly heard. So there's a lot of um, misconception about, about him and around him. And, you know, people like that, also, they hardly talk. They hardly grant interviews. Mm -hmm. they, you know, you just hear so many about. But it's um, it's a big blow to this government, especially given the fact that the president is who he is. Is the type also that you hardly hear from, and that there's been scheming all around. You know, the, the presidency and then um, Abakari has been able to hold you know that office together and do what he needs to do and when he needed to do them. Considering the fact that you have. 
you know, what I would call a lot of hawks mm -hmm. in, um, around the president. And then also, the, lastly, because these people, you, we've seen a lot of conflicting interests. President Obama Dubarbin, who he is, he's somebody who seems not to be in charge. Mm -hmm. So the man who, who, who seemingly, you know, created that opportunity or present that front of, look, yes, the presidency is in charge, mm -hmm. is Abakari. So I doubt if we'll be able to get somebody like him again. It's quite unfortunate, God rest his soul. Mm -hmm. um, and then this goes to show that truly COVID-19 is real. Uh, for those that have been doubting that Fizzo is all politics, it shows that it's real. Mm -hmm. He's taking one of the biggest in Nigeria. I mean, he's the, the biggest facto, victim now. Yeah, the de facto so. president. And then on the flip side, government should see this in memory of um, Abakari to use this opportunity to revamp the head sector. Because that brings me to my next question. Um, like you rightly said, he's the biggest victim um, in terms of the political and leadership space. Do you think his death will be a wake-up call to the government, especially in tackling COVID-19? Because we've also seen, you know, laxity in different ways. Yeah, uh, I, I think it should. It, it, it should be a wake-up call, if not, if not for him at all. But the fact that they are not able to fly abroad for mm. medical treatment the way they're used to. You see them, you know, if you were before you, the, you, the tweet would probably read, he died in a London hospital or in a Germany hospital where he was receiving treatment for so and so and so. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, they are not even, they're even ashamed to announce where he died. You know, that's to tell you how shameless, you know, people in government can be. And so even if not for Abba Kiari's death, they should see this as an opportunity to remember that the time will come if they do not take care of you know, the institutions and infrastructures around us. It might be difficult for them to jet out to other people's own to take care of, uh, of them, of themselves. So, mm -hmm. And that's why they need to provide those infrastructure. Imagine the vice president, the president's wife, you know, shouting at the top of her voice that the Aso Rock Clinic do not have Panadol. Mm -hmm. You know, so... And if, if we are a serious-minded country, I had expected that, you know, the chief of staff to the president, or what do you, if you like, you call him the de facto president, that the clinic should have been top-notch to be, be able to take care of him. Mm -hmm. But you saw how there were speculations. Some people said they flew him to Cuba. Some said he was in Lagos. And, you know, so it's shameful mm -hmm. that we couldn't even come out to say this is the hospital where he's receiving treatment because of lack of infrastructure to handle the matter. And so, warnings for us, other people who have age, aged parents and, you know, the fact that if the de facto president of the country, mm. the country cannot take care of him, then you better keep yours very safe and very far away from COVID-19. I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about the culture of secrecy in our leadership. But before we get there, now, um, are, you, are we likely going to see some more lockdown in states uh, because as you do know, there are conversations or rather arguments whether some states are saying should they lock down, should they lock down, especially in the north. And we are seeing the increasing rate of COVID-19. Again, in as much as we're talking about a, a leader now, should we see that other states are taking this seriously and we go into maybe a national lockdown to be able to hold on and curtail the spread and even stop it moving forward? Um, I'm not an advocate of um, this copy and paste, what I call copy and paste uh, mentality or attitude to, you know, tackling the, the, the pandemic. Um, every state has, a, uh, you know, the peculiarity of um, the crisis in their states. Mm -hmm. Lagos State, for example, before the national lockdown, had a partial lockdown. And then, like, take a state like a choir bomb, for example, you had about five or six cases there. Right. And as sat the day before yesterday, you know, all of them had been discharged. Mm -hmm. Tested and, and, negative twice. Yes. And so for a state like that, you can't also say because other states are locked down, so you need to lock them down also. But, but you how can about interstates? You can, yes, you can protect, that's what I'm going to, you can protect your borders and have a quarantine method, you know, for people who are coming in and then you restrict movement around those borders, but you allow, you know, work to go on within your state. If we had taken those steps Early. timelessly, earlier, and to lock our borders, like 
Tanzania had done. Tanzania didn't lock their border, but they have a system, a 14 days compulsory quarantine for those coming in. But the government had said there's no space mm -hmm. for them to quarantine everybody coming in. But then, if we had taken those preemptive steps around our border early enough, we probably would have still been walking around now, you know, and be able to keep COVID-19 out. And so let's allow the governor treat states, you know, according to the peculiarity of the crisis in their state. And not this approach of once the president announced, you know, uh, lockdown of Abuja, Lagos, and uh, and okay. Kuku, and then everybody just follows suit because you want to please the government at the centre. But do you think we are taking this whole COVID nineteen case seriously? We are not actually. Um, we seems to be just you know copying. Because another thing we are not doing also is the fact that we just sit down there, we're waiting and hoping mm -hmm. that the vaccine will come from somewhere abroad. And then all of us can ask, oh, yes, shout to Uhuru. Oh, yes, there is a vaccine. What are we doing in terms of, is it forbidding that the vaccine should come from Africa or from mm -hmm. Nigeria? Mm -hmm. You know, what are we doing in terms of studying, research, to also create a vaccine for it? We are not even discussing that at all. And then you hear people, you know, the average man on the street had asked the question, um, uh, what do you call it, that there's no cure for the coronavirus, but yet, you know, people are being discharged. Yeah. The, the, this idea of, I know government would want to be careful so as not to encourage self-medication, because the moment you say, oh, this is the drugs we are we using used. to treat them, mm -hmm. you know, people we would want to self-medicate, exactly, treat ourselves at home. But then also there is a way you can also release information and consistent information to ensure that, yes, if you can't manage all the cases, there are some cases also that, you know, experts can manage, you know, at different uh, places, but especially when, if you have a flu-blown crisis, it becomes difficult to take, mm -hmm. for you to take care of all of them. And then also, coupled with the fact that if you lock down for too long, mm -hmm. people might be compelled to go all out because you cannot sustain their means of livelihood, considering that the fact that about 95% of your population are people who work with, you know, small and medium scale uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. And then also, when salary, when there is no work, salaries won't be paid. And when salaries are not paid, the multiplying effect, you know, will push force people out, out of their houses. So when you do all of this, there's need for you to learn how to manage information that you give to them, mm -hmm. you know, release them and ensure that education is consistent while also looking at your possibility of finding a, a, you know, a lasting solution to Now, it. talking about managing information, and of course, again, with the death of Abakiari, um, many people, we have said that um, in this country, we have, there's a lot of culture of secrecy going yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, did you think that our government is transparent enough? <laughs> Especially, yes, regarding COVID-19 leaders, are we seeing a lot of transparency? Is it a time to be unhealthily secret, for lack of a better word? Yeah, because um, when um, you, have, um, you have failed the people, it is common for you to not say anything to them because there's nothing to say to them. And um, so you now want to hide under the fact that, oh yes, government activities, you know, these are secret issues. We don't want to unnecessarily release information. We don't want to raise alarm. We don't want to panic the people. So both those things that should be transparent are all kept, you know, under the table. Look at, compare the case of Fabakari with that of the Prime Minister of the UK. Right. The moment the Prime Minister went, you know, into ICU, Everybody knew that the Prime Minister was in ICU. The day he was discharged, you saw the rousing ovation and welcome, the pictures, videos, and you know, this transparency. You mm -hmm. can't you can you can't hide all of this. It also shows it helped you know the people to it boost their confidence in the system. It shows that look, the things can be done. Mm -hmm. If the Prime Minister had to would go through this. You know, there is no fear. It means that even you, you can go into ICU mm -hmm. and still come oh. out. It's a way of boosting confidence. You remember also, the fear of coronavirus and stigmatization, you know, reduced the moment, you know, some of those patients at the uh, disease, uh, 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 center, disease yes, center, the infectious disease center, released the video of what was going on oh, there. The you know, it helps also build confidence in the people that it's not a death sentence. Mm -hmm. you know, so, but for government, now nobody even knows the hospital where he died, where he was receiving treatment, mm -hmm. whether I was at home, whether I was in Cuba, whether I was in Lagos. What, you know, 
all, all of that is in secret. And so, when there is an um, absence of information, it gives room for rumors. And when rumors start to thrive, even intellectuals are turned to convey your bet. Mm -hmm. And so that's the way we run government here. And it's very, very, very bad. And it doesn't help in building confidence in the people because rumor will take the place of information. Mm -hmm. And anybody, you now begin to wonder, which one do you believe? If this one comes out, they say, no, it's fake news. Give me the authentic one. There is no information anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's the same way we run government. I, had, I once read an article of um, a, a research student from the UK who is a Nigerian. He came to Nigeria for a research. He had sent his questionnaires to government offices beforehand. The same thing he did with government in Ghana. He said while he immediately got to the minister's office in Ghana, they were already waiting for him. Mm. He got to Nigeria. He spent three days. He couldn't talk to anybody because everybody keep buck passing. And that's the way we run government here, and it's very bad. And we're also seeing it now with um, the death of um, the, the chief of staff to the president. Mm -hmm. We're even lucky that, um, you know, we, we are even informed immediately it, it happened. Or like some situations where you won't hear, then mm -hmm. rumors will set in. Remember Kemi Olun lawyer had once said that one big person at the villa mm -hmm. had died. You know, some persons also, but some mischievous Nigerians who might even say that, oh, the man had died before now, that, you know, they are just releasing mm. information in the absence of information. Yeah, I mean, because we are not purveyors of fake news here at yeah. Plus TV Africa, we will stick to no, I'm uh, saying the that, information we yeah, have. Yeah, I agree with you. What I'm mm. saying is that, yes, we are happy that the information came out mm -hmm. uh, because I believe the man just died. I wouldn't have believed that of Kemi Olu lawyer. But I'm saying that... In the absence of information, we give you know, room to news like that, we give room to news like that, mm -hmm. and then people, some people definitely will believe, you know, um, 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 what do you call it, um, uh, um, people who, mischievous people, mm -hmm. would, you know, go to town with, you know, because also. of the absence of trust. Mm. Information breeds trust. Right. Okay, let's talk about the gaps that, you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, has shown in our leadership system. While um, Abba Kiari tested positive, we heard the speculation of being moved to Lagos. And at you know, some point he said, well, he's, he wants to go into a private facility because he doesn't want to burden the government. Um, we know the amount of money that has been budgeted into the health sector. What is happening such that we are not even able to rise up to the situation and say, you know what, even if you're in Abuja or you're in Kotongora, wherever you are, there will be a facility, health facility, that will be able to cater for any form of illness. You see, there's what we call political correctness. Which is? Um, uh, wanting to go into a private facility is politically, political correctness. Mm. If the public facilities were up to date, were top notch. There was no need for the de facto president to say mm -hmm. that, you know, he wants to go, the late uh, Abakai to say he wants to go into a private facility because he doesn't want to bother the government. What actually happens is, oh, I don't have faith in the public health institution, mm -hmm. so I would rather want a situation where I would, you know, be managed in a private facility, you know, by, you know, private people who I can... Who I trust. Who I trust, who I can relate with. And to add to that, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation also now said that he didn't know mm -hmm. that the state of our healthcare system was this bad. And so that shows that even the later Bakari does not have faith in the healthcare system. And if those who are saddled with the responsibility of managing the system, to manage the government, does not have faith in the institutions of mm -hmm. government, not is it you and I that do not even have anything. You know, what it means is that what we have is a situation where, okay, if you say you do not have faith in this system, you know, you're going to raise alarm. Mm -hmm. You're going to create sentiment. So just say, I don't want to bother, bother the government. Whether you bother the government or not, even if you're in a private institution, the government being, you know, a top-ranking officer, the government will ensure that everybody attending to you is top-notch. Mm -hmm. You're properly taking care of book because it's almost as if the president is in that situation. You know, so that's, that's what has happened. And so that also brings me to the fact that uh, public institutions, I took time to compare photographs 
of our national hospitals mm -hmm. with the national office of the EFCC, the ICPC. And you will cry. So we build these massive structures for, you know, um, institutions, at corruption institutions, we build massive structures for national hotels, mm -hmm. but you we forget and neglect that, you know, health is wealth. And because we always have opportunity to fly abroad, mm -hmm. even our president is so shameful that our presidents will, you know, dash abroad for even the smallest of ailments. But we are happy and lucky that it is not Mr. President. Do you know the crisis would have been now mm -hmm. if that had happened? Because we know what happened with uh, Omaru Yaradua, Yaradua how he, uh, we couldn't treat our president here. One would have expected that that would sound or, you know, be a learning curve mm -hmm. for any other incoming president. Gulag Jonathan came and didn't do anything about the health sector. sector. President Buhari came. And even though he also had his own health crisis, because he could go abroad, he didn't also he neglect, even when his wife was, was shouting. Now, that same crisis has taken one of his. Hmm. One would have expected that it would sound as a lesson. When all of this is over, I tell you, they will not care because we've seen part one. So part B will not be different from part, part one, hmm. part A. So I would expect, I'm not looking at this crop of leaders for any hope um, at, at all. So let this, but that won't stop us from still advising, that let this be an opportunity to change orientation in government and the way we run government. Because if the facilities were available, the public institutions would have been better managed than even the private one. I remember growing up, if you attend, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, private schools, mm -hmm. private primary schools or secondary schools, nobody reckons with you because the public uh, schools were top-notch. The public hospitals were top-notch. Right. But when we started destroying the public ones, you know, Private, private ones, you know, sprang up and there was opportunity for better private hospitals. That's why they would rather, since they can't go abroad, they would rather, you know, look at, look towards the private hospitals. I think that's why he made that statement. But let them also remember, including some of them who are in private, who are in public hospitals and using public funds mm -hmm. to feather their own private hospitals. Let them also remember that in times of war and crisis, you know, Crisis does not know wealth, it does not know rich, it does not know poor, it does not know age. Once it comes, anybody can be effect affected, including you and I. So when given such opportunity, irrespective of our position, let us you know, stand out and ask ourselves, what would we want to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. If they, at the end of the day there is a crisis, there is a pandemic, will I be confident enough to go to that health institution that I am managing? Mm -hmm. Will I be confident enough to send my children to schools in the uh, uh, secondary school that I'm superintending? A situation you have a commissioner for, for education who does not have faith in the education system, system. in the state. You know, that's basically what has just happened now. All right, before I let you go, um, what lessons do you think that this is bringing to us as a people, especially in the face of the crisis of COVID-19? Because we are not done with COVID-19 as far as we We have not even know. started. Right, so what lessons uh, are there for us, um, even as an ordinary Nigerian or the person who's in leadership? Twofold, um, I will look at it first and foremost, like, from the uh, private life and then look at it from the pot political life. Because as I speak now, people will already be jostling for Abakari's position. Yes. I can tell you mm -hmm. that for sure. The man had not even been laid to rest. People will be jostling for his position. People will be fighting. People will be because making Because there's a calls. political vacancy. There's a so political vacancy. What it should, lessons for us should be that the moment you leave, it's too many silence. The moment and your position, others will take. So your health is very, very important. Your environment is very important. When government, so government also should understand whether you're a governor today, whether you're a president, you should also understand that you know, health is no respecter of persons. It's no respecter of persons. If you fail to put the right structures in place. When the whirlwind of ill health comes, 
it might just sweep you. Mm -hmm. and, and so for us as a people, we should also know that if we do not hold our government accountable, when the time comes, all of us will be helpless because it will be so sad. It is different from you to so. Some people will tell you, um, yes, I can take a go, but those your age parents at home, who you still love, who you still want to see around for the next 10 years, mm -hmm. can Agbo and Doguyaru treat them mm. because of other underlying factors. So the time to begin to hold our government accountable, be you APC, be you PDP, is now because it has no political face. Because if you begin to create excuses for government, and when the crisis comes, the crisis will not hold on to those excuses. Right. It might just sweep one of yours, and that time might be too late. Hmm. Thank you so very much, Liberal Sashoma. My pleasure. And now, still on the death of uh, Abba Kiari, we take a look at his educational background. <laughs> 